Hello, my name is Peter Sellers. I am directing Mozart's La Clemenza di Tito at the Salzburg Festival. La Clemenza di Tito is deeply Mozart's last opera. He was writing it at the same time as the Magic Flute. And it's Mozart's last thoughts about reconciliation. What does it mean for people to come together in a spirit of difference, of acknowledgement of histories that have not been correct, of injustices, betrayals? Or does it mean that somehow we find a way to come together after all of that? I'm working with an amazing cast of singers and a cast that I think can represent a future leadership of Europe. In the Salzburg Festival, this cast has created extraordinary comment, and that's because it's an extraordinary cast. And you will meet four of them tonight. My father was a man of very few words. I mean, like, very few. For example, I said to my father once, um, I was nine years old, and I said, Daddy, I heard the trumpet. I'd like to uh, have some lessons to, to play the trumpet. And he went, mm-hmm. That was the end of the discussion. Now, it's, he didn't know where he would send me to have lessons. What is a trumpet anyway? And, you know, and he didn't have the money and so on. So there, there weren't, the avenues weren't open to him. So what could he do with this little boy who wanted to play the trumpet? Are you, are you crazy? He didn't say I was crazy. He said, mm-hmm. He went to a performance once that I was doing in Jamaica. Didn't tell me he was going. He had heard that I was doing it because I was talking around the house of doing this thing. And I even said, would you like to come to see? <laughs> was his response. And one night, he loved playing solitaire in the kitchen. And I went in one and he said, hmm. I said, hi, Daddy. He said, hmm. Uh, who was that half Chinese girl you were with? And I went, half Chinese girl? What do you mean? Um, yeah, you know, the one um, you were with there. Now, the only half Chinese girl that I was with was on stage in this piece that I was singing. So I said, oh, you mean in the, in, the, in, the, in the pantomime that you saw, you, you saw it? And you went, hmm. Did you, did you, what do you think of it? All right. And so when I told him that I would like to study classical music um, in New York, um, he said, OK, you like it? Fine. And he helped me with the fare to go to New York. But he was, he, he loved me, but he never spoke it. He was just there like a solid rock. What did we do before we went on the stage last night? <laughs> we all literally, she and I made the, the four of us get together in a group and just be like, black people, we're going on the stage. <laughs> it's a big historical moment to be in Salzburg, Austria, with four black people, equal two men, two women, in a major, in a mainstream, in a very important opera with a very important composer, and it's not Porgy and Bess. Can I just say that? I... It's not Porgy and Bess. <laughs> Can I say that to the camera? One more time. Straight? It's not Porgy and Bess. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I've... 
It's incredible. And also in main roles, in major roles, like not the... Really the protagonists who are telling the story. Yeah. It's not just like, you know, those kinds of characters that are just there on the periphery to just add color. South Africa, just for geography's sake, is at the tip, bottom of Africa. That's a very long way from Europe, a very long way what from America. I don't even know where your country <laughs> is. That's how bad the geography is of people's like socio-political situation. Like we come from these places where we don't necessarily have that kind of access to everything that every other singer has. Like some of our other colleagues who grew up in London who can go to the Royal Academy, the Royal College, Trinity and College, Guild. I didn't even hear an opera until I was 19 years old. But then I did, and I was like, wow, that's something really cool. But when you don't have that kind of access, of course it's going to look like it's a rarefied thing when one of the two of us come out. But there are, there are hundreds of talented singers of color all over. I came home, uh, no, I'm, I'm definitely, it was eight years old. I came home from school, turned on the radio, uh, flipping through the stations, and I heard people singing kind of funny. Uh, and I was in choir in elementary school, and uh, so I was interested in music, but I didn't really know anything about it. Uh, I heard this, these voices uh, singing loud and sort of obnoxious, and <laughs> I was in love with it. Uh, and so the next day I came home from school, and I turned on the radio, and I waited until some opera came on. And I listened again, and the next day, and the next day, and the next day. My grandmother and I went on a trip to New York um, much later. Uh, and uh, one of her friends uh, said, oh, I notice he keeps listening to opera and classical music, you know, in, in the Met. Uh, you know, we have the Met, we have New York City Opera, you know, best opera in, is in New York, in America, you know. So we went to New York City Opera. I saw Carmen, and uh, I remember telling my grandmother, you know, I'm going to do that when I get older, you know. And she looked at me and she said, of course you are, <laughs> you know. It was sort of like, yeah, of course you are. Yeah, you can do anything you put your mind to. One day I was leaving the Juilliard after the, my first week of uh, study there and I heard some strings um, like tuning up like uh, a few string players are going to play something and I thought, oh, faculty members are going to have a little jam session or something like that. And so I opened the auditorium's door and there I saw first year students tuning up for an orchestra rehearsal and there were about 60 of them on the stage brandishing various instruments of various sizes. And I thought, I can't do this. This is too much. I'm not ready for this. I, I have to go back home. Oh my goodness. Plus walking down the street, I, this is uh, not very nice, but walking down the street a, a few times and I see one of my classmates or, or people that I've seen, the Juliet, and I raise my hand to say, hey, and they find something very interesting to look at across the road, um, which I thought was normal. But then when it happened several times, I thought, oh, this is a really interesting thing. So I had to double my courage and find my shoes and stand in them knowing that no one else can stand in my shoes if I'm wearing my shoes, so I need to wear them very clearly and definitely. Oh, well, growing up in a, in a, in a Southern family uh, with a grandmother that's a preacher uh, and uh, a mother that's <laughs> the black sheep of the family and figuring out, you know, my place in it all. When I was a kid, or when I, just, when I grew up, I, just, I said I wanted to be a parent so I could be a better parent than the shit parents that I had. Um, and that was always something that I, did, I wanted, I longed for it. Uh, and when the opportunity came to adopt, 
uh, I jumped at it. Uh, and yeah, it's been a, I mean, it's the scariest thing and it's the most rewarding thing. And the energy of having to be responsible for this little life, that is definitely a part of my performance. I think about it often. And my, you know, very religious upbringing, you know, very religious upbringing is also a part of my performance. There's a lot of baggage that goes with being a singer of color in this business. It's like you can't dissect in just one conversation. And it's really frustrating because we can, like what we're doing in this conversation, it's, yeah, we're getting to some core things. But I remember one of my... Um, um, one of the teachers at my conservatory in Cape Town before I came to America um, telling me and just and I had no idea but he was the one who actually told me like be careful what you wish for as a singer of color because he came to Europe he had a career in Europe he studied at Juilliard just like I did I practically followed the same path he went from South Africa to Juilliard, was a sing one of the few singers of color at the Juilliard school. Then from Juilliard, went over to Germany, got a job in an ensemble, became a traveling singer, sung in Axon Provence, sung all these wonderful theaters. And he said, but most nights he would go back to the apartment, the hotel where he said, and cry in the shower because at some time during the day, even though he'd sung his best performance of Otello, someone had called him a derogatory name. Mm. Someone had said something who didn't know anything about him, but had said something that just cut him deep. And he said to me, that's what it is to be a singer of color. Because there's so much other baggage that you have to leave at the door of rehearsal and you got to pick it up when you go and then you go cry about it at home. And that was, his, that was the biggest piece of advice that he gave me, like, don't leave the baggage at the door of rehearsal. Pick it up, and you can go cry about it in, the, in, your, you, in your shower. You gave me a good piece of advice when that incident happened to me here in Austria, which was... Put it on stage. Put it, put it in, put it in, in the, the Kyrie. And, and, that, that's really what helps, and that's what I in, started doing myself, because that advice, that was... The, you know when we talked about it, where you spoke about, like, there's old school advice of the singers who've been there before mm -hmm. who give you that advice because that's how they survived because you were one in a room of a hundred white people and there's no one to engage with about that experience with you. So you leave it at the door and you pick it up and take it home. But we don't have to do that now. So you put it in the work. My experience as a black man uh, and as an American and as a man, you know, all these different things color my um, my performance, my interpretation of, if I read a phrase, uh, you know, of, of text, how I read that text or how I feel that text or how it settles on me uh, is not gonna be the same way that it will settle on you. And I'm sure it's your life experiences, uh, be it you as a white male and then me as a black man that makes those, those uh, distinctions, I think so. And especially as a black man now, <clears throat> an American black man, and you know, given our political cl climate that we just came from and what we're, what we're experiencing now, you know, all of those things make a big difference. You know, make a big difference in our. I remember um, I did an, an audition once with a group of my um, colleagues who were not my from my um, race, and I didn't get the job. And I, I went back to the Juilliard and I was recounting this to a couple of people who looked like me. And they said, oh, it's because you're that way, you know, it'll never work. And I thought that was a bit too easy. I didn't argue with them. And I went and I found a room, practice room on the fourth floor, the wonderful fourth floor at the Juilliard with a yellow carpet. <laughs> And I, um, I worked, I worked, and uh, six months later, I did an audition, didn't tell anyone, got the job, and um, discovered that it is what you present 
in this life that what you tend to get back. Even the unspoken part of your presentation. It's, it's a little too easy to always say something is about, you know, race. Uh, but I found that, I mean, I wasn't ready in a, in a lot of sense of, the, sense of the word. I mean, my languages weren't great. Uh, you know, technical things vocally that I needed to work on, you know, all of those things. There were some strong, like, racial situations that happened, you know, very bluntly, you know, uh, very early on. Uh, but once I got to the Met, I think a lot of that slowed down. Um, uh, but who, have, who really knows? Because it's all, you know, so subjective. So you can't really say that it was, it was about race, you know. I've gotten, oh, he's not right for the production quite a bit, you know. But what does that mean, you know? I could be too fat for the production, you know? Which I've gotten that before, too. But, you know, who knows what it means? You can't react the way other people would react to indignities because there's another layer upon which people judge you that they don't necessarily judge other singers on, singers who aren't of color. Like, we were always talking about, you can't be an angry black woman. Don't oh get angry. Gosh, you can't. Don't get angry. You don't get upset. You, you can't show um, emotion in that way. You have to always be extra nice, smile all the time, because for whatever reason, there's a prejudice on black people in general anyway, that, <clears throat> that they're angry, um, upset, aggressive. You know, any negative form that you could find, any negative any adjective. Any negative adjective, yeah. Singers in general feel a need to please everybody. They need to be hired again. They need to get another job. They're always thinking, instead of the job that they have at that moment, they're thinking about, how do I get the next job? You know, how do I get invited back? And that's never been my thing, you know. But you sh should always, I don't know, command or demand and give a certain level of respect um, and know who you are and, not, and be willing to stick to, the, to that even if it's not necessarily popular, you know. And I've always been um, interested in being true to who I am as an artist, as a person, as a man, uh, even if it's not popular. Um, my face tends to have apparently a resting, upset face. <laughs> resting bitch face? Right. So, mm -hmm. well, I don't want to say it that way, but, you know, just, resting bitch face. just, just, you know, and people think that I'm upset, and I'm really not upset. I'm at work, you and I'm work. concentrating, I'm, well, I'm concentrating <laughs> on the job at hand. And you would expect that the person would respect me because of that. Mm. But they but the reports back, you know, they to the agency back, yeah. or to the is like, you know, well, Janine was lovely to work with, with but, but you know, and it's like, but wait a second, did I not sing my face off on stage? Yeah. Wait a second, didn't mm. your reviews come out really well? I mean, you know, but there and so I've been told by actual fellow colleagues um, who are older than me that when you go in, Janine, and you're the only black person there, you make sure you are there. You are not there five minutes before time. You are there ten minutes before the call, because you're black. You will smile at all costs. Why? Because you're black. You will know all of your music and be prepared, know all the words, and not just because you want to be a good musician, but because you're black. And all of this extraness, because they want to, they want you to make sure that you are always seen in the best light. Because the prejudice lies neg negatively um, around us being black, you don't want to give them any opportunity to have anything to say. And so I discovered that there was a comfort zone that uh, of my um, colleagues who felt that they looked like each other, so there everything is fine. And there was I the different one. But as I looked on, I saw that no two people were the same. There's a comfort zone that you can, when you're in your group of a racial group or national group or whatever, that you can feel a sort of comfort of togetherness and numbers. But in actual fact, we're all different. I realized that I am totally different from anyone else that I could encounter. I'm so different from my sister. I've lived in a very poor area uh, growing up, and I lived around a lot of drugs and a lot of weed. <laughs> and I always t remember where I came from, 
and those experiences to bring into the rules. And it was my wish to share that with my colleagues who are not black, <clears throat> to understand that from not just watching it on TV or doing a YouTube clip, but to hear it from the source, to hear it from us. Whenever I see a police and I instantly think of, you know, those big camp, those big camp campers driving down the road, shooting up smoke at you, tear gas, like a war zone. That's my experience of police. It's not what people see here because that's how I grew up. So it's very different from all of them. So in, so in that instant, I mean, when, when I see that extra run on stage, it's very difficult for me not to have my natural reaction, which is leave. Being a black singer on the road, being a black international singer on the road, a non-American black singer on the road, a non-European singer the black list keeps on going the road. There's a whole other dynamic. I remember She's one of my- South African. Sorry. I'm from Trinidad. We both have to get visas every time- You travel. We and it's, travel And away. trying to explain that then also to people like your agents who most problem predominantly come from Europe. And they England, only deal with European and only, people. And they've got passports that, that ride, you know, ticket to ride, German passport, ticket to ride, UK, ticket to ride, American passport. But as South African passport, the green mamba, as we call it, that thing's really difficult to travel with. Black female traveling alone <laughs> singer. But I mean... <laughs> it's really rough. It's, and I've gotten stopped. Yeah, yeah. you know. And double searched. I was going through my score and uh, I decided I'd take a break. And my other self said, you know, if you start watching television, you're going to get caught in something. Anybody watching it for the next two hours? I said, no, I am the master. I will watch it for half an hour, 20 minutes, and that's it, and turn it off. So I went to, and I turned the television on, and it was a PBS broadcast, and I think Campbell, I think his name was, was giving a series of talks on the myths, the great myths of our, that influence his life and how they came about. And this night he was talking about the dragon. And he said that we all have our dragons. And I thought, oh, my dragon is this messian piece. There is no dragon to be, I'm going to make friends with the dragon and use his fire. And so I did. And I, it was a it was a most amazing experience for me this 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 whole thing because um, many people who saw it, people in the orchestra, they were saying, I don't quite know what happened, but somehow or other, profoundly, my life has changed. It's never the people who are oppressed who can make the change. It, we need the people who want to stay in their lane to go, actually, I can't, I shouldn't. I need to actively engage with what's happening. So I need to pick up the mantle that the oppressed have put in front of me and go, yeah, okay, it's heavy. You've been carrying it for a couple of hundred years, so I'll take it for another 50. There is a very important ingredient that the human being has that helps to guarantee your path and helps you to discover who you are, and that is to dare to follow your heart. I appreciate the fact that we uh, are steadily uh, invited for a seat at the table, and that's very important. And even seeing my colleagues like Eric uh, who's sitting on boards now. And that's so important. Uh, uh, that's very, very important to make sure that, uh, that black singers, uh, no matter where you're from, Africa or Jamaica or wherever you're from, have a seat at the table. That's very important. Because if people in the back office don't look like us, then people on stage won't look like us and people in the audience won't look like us. And it's a never ending cycle. Uh, but the more you put us on stage and give us opportunities, uh, you can change all of that. <laughs>